Hey, good morning, Lake Merced and whoever you may be joining us from wherever you may be joining us. Uh, welcome to my humble abode. Welcome to my home. Uh, it's, a, it's a joy and an honor to invite you in here today and to spend a, a few minutes with you just talking about Jesus. That's what this is all about. Uh, we're so glad that you stopped in. We're so glad that you're, you're streaming with us and spending a, a few minutes with us. We want to invite you and encourage you just to spend this time faithfully with God. Uh, I want to ask you to do me a couple of favors. Number one, as you join us this morning, would you, if you're on YouTube, would you go ahead and, and subscribe to us? Uh, it's a great way for us to know that you're, you're there and you're plugged in and to stay connected with you. And if you would share this link. Also, if you're on Facebook, like the Lake Merced Church of Christ page and uh, go ahead and give it a share on your newsfeed. We'd love for, for your network of friends to, to know something more about Jesus. Uh, this is a, a, an important and timely message, I think, today as we talk about the intersection between exile to our homes and the exile that Israel faced. And so we're glad that you're here. Would you click that share button for us? We're so glad that you're here with us. Let's praise God. <laughs> Good morning, Lake Merced. Uh, my name is Corey Justice, and um, I'm actually kind of nervous, not going to lie, but I will be uh, guiding you in this morning's opening prayer. Um, just as an update, I know I haven't seen you guys in a while. Um, everything is going well. Um, you know, we are surviving the quarantine, and uh, yeah, everything is just going really good, really solid right now. So, uh, Let's uh, bow our heads as we go into our opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today just to say thank you for allowing the loved ones that we have to be around. And we really thank you for allowing us to continue to spread your, your word and to be sponges and absorb your word. I just hope that we can continue to, to, to spread the truth and the light that you have given us and that we can operate in our highest selves as you would want us to and i pray that you just continue to guide each foot um in every every day of our life i ask that you please just watch over this world as we go through this this tough time and things are on lockdown and i just pray that you uh restore it to a a, a condition that is suiting to you lord and that we can really wake up and realize that uh, this is a, the, the most perfect time to be to be focused on you. And and we just want to just continue to just be the best that, that we honestly can be as Christians. Um, I pray that you you forgive us for our sins knowingly and unknowingly. And um, just thank you that you continue to shower us with, with grace and mercy. Uh, for me personally, I pray that I'm I'm just a better, better son to my mom and a better son to my dad, a better brother and a better friend to my friends. And I ask that you just please just continue to work on me and my character, and and allow that to to flourish into into something beautiful that you would that you would be able to use for a greater purpose. And as we go through this church service, just ask that you just give us the open hearts and open minds that we need to absorb the word that we that we really need. There's a word in here for, for somebody and there's a word in here for everybody. And just pray that we just we are just really listening closely for for what you're trying to tell us. Um and as we continue on throughout our journey, just just watch over us. Just keep a just keep a hedge around us. All of our families, all the families that are going through something, that may have lost a loved one. Just just really be with them and just and just hold them and and just give them a sign that you that you're there with them and give them the 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 heart to know that you're there with them right now. Um, we ask it all in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is so weak. So light the fire in 
my soul and fan the flame, make me whole. Oh, Lord, you know where I've been, so light the fire in my heart again. I feel your arms around me as the power of your healing begins. Your spirit moves right through me like a mighty rushing wind. So light the fire in my soul and fan the flame, make me whole. Oh Lord, you know where I've been. So light the fire in my heart again. So light the fire in my soul and fan the flame, make me whole. Oh Lord, you know where I've been. Oh, light the fire in my heart again. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender humbly at his feet I vow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee, fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me, I surrender surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Good morning. At this time, we take the time out during the service to remember Jesus on the cross. We take this time to, uh, if, we, if you have the means to take the bread, which is Jesus' body, uh, the fruit of the vine, which is Jesus' blood, and take that. There are scriptures that remind me that Jesus actually died and he's Lord of our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come 
and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Then you have Paul, he writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. Then there's other scriptures here that impacted my uh, my walk. And it's something that God called me to change. In Ephesians 5, 21 through 32, it says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husband. Wives, submit to your, to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present to her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are, we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and, be, and, be, and will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking to you about Christ and the church. And th there's several things that come out in the scriptures. There's one body, there's one faith, there's one Lord. And to have that kind of relationship with our God, with Jesus, with our spouses, with our kids. It takes work. It says make every effort for a bond of peace. Right now, we're all going through this uh, virus 19. We're all separated. But I think God has a purpose. I think the separation is it's not about church buildings. It's about becoming one. It's about if a, if, if a person believes, has, has faith, believes in baptism for the right reasons, repentance, then they're part of the body. Just like the scriptures that we read, for the letters from different churches. I mean, we believe and we obey and they're still from different believers, from different church buildings or bodies. They create one body, Jesus being the head. I know for myself, it took a lot of work for me and my wife to fix our relationship. We had to get up at five o'clock in the morning to get with a believer who was a marriage counselor. And me and my wife didn't have to be at work until like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, but we had to work for our relationship. And I think Jesus is saying that, hey, we need to work for our relationships with our God and our Father. It takes work to get up through all the changes we're having to face. Right now, my hours have changed for work. 
I'm getting up, I'm, I'm having to get up earlier in the morning to go to work. And so am I making every effort to keep my relationship with God where it's supposed to be? Am I getting up earlier in the morning to make things happen? Like I did with my, with building my relationship up back with my wife. These are things that I need to work on. I need to change. So as, as we take the Lord's Supper, remember Jesus, all he did, all he had to fight through for us to have this relationship, for him, for him, to, for him to have his relationship with God in the full. He had to die, he had to be buried, and he had to be resurrected for us to have a relationship with God. And that was a lot of work. Right now, if if you're not working hard in your relationships, then look at the scriptures, look at Jesus, look at his example. Are we seeking him first? Please pray with me for the Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, Dad, thank you for today. Thank you for everything you give us. Thank you for your son, him having a, you guys having a plan to die for us, to give us hope. Father, please help us to make every effort to have relationships with you, make every effort to have relationships with each other, with the body of believers. Father, help us to reach out to people and share the great news that your son died for them to have hope, to have a future. Father, I thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So there's this part in one of Paul's letters, it's the Apostle Paul, and he's writing this letter to the church in Corinth. And he's talking about generosity. And he says, you know, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you about what God has, has done in the churches in Macedonia. And so he says, out of the most severe trial, think about where we are right now, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, uh, they welled up in rich generosity. Out of, out of trial and poverty, they welled up in generosity. And he says in verse 5, uh, And they, they did not do as we expected, but they, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. And I share all that to say, like, that that's... That's really at the heart of what giving is when we, we talk about giving within the church. It's an opportunity to, to give first to the Lord. That, that's, that's what we're doing this for. And secondarily then, it goes to the, the saints, it goes to the church, it goes to, to people who are in need. And so this is the time in the service where we wanna carve out a little bit of time for you to give uh, generously to the church. And we, we recognize some, some of us are in poverty. Some of us are, are facing severe trial, just like the, the churches in Macedonia that Paul's talking about here. And yet we still have this opportunity to give. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's, it's easy for us to want to to hold on to the things that, that we have out, out of fear that we may not have enough. Uh, but but that's kind of the, the intersection of, of generosity and faith. Faith is 
being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It, it's trusting that, that God's going to take care of us uh, no matter what. And so I don't know what God's doing on your heart right now, but is there a chance that, that he's wanting you to give? And maybe it's not even to us. Maybe it's to uh, another church or another ministry or another opportunity that this isn't about Lake Merced being self-seeking, but this is a chance for you to give from a place of, of grace and a place of generosity to help those in need. Is there something that God's calling you to give today? If you'd like to, to give and support the work here at Lake Merced in San Francisco, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you go to our website, there's two ways you can give online. If you go to our website, go to lakemercedchurch.com, go up into the top right-hand corner and click that giving button. You'll see a drop-down menu, and you'll have the opportunity to set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. We'd love if you'd consider doing that. And secondarily, if you have your phone with you, you can get your phone out and you can type a dollar amount, 25, 100, 125, whatever God's calling you to do right now. And if you text that to the number 84321, yeah, easy to remember, 84321, uh, it'll text you back immediately and you'll, you'll be set up with everything you need to do to make a donation to, to Lake Merced Church of Christ. Uh, we pray that you will. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you for giving. Remember, this goes to God first and foremost. And secondarily, it goes to bless other people. And we would love to be a church that is equipped to bless others as the needs arise in the weeks and months to come. God bless you, my friends. Thank you. This is the season for a new anointing. This is the season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may arise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. In the beginning God created, and for His pleasure all creation sings. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine. Shine. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine as we declare this is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory fill the earth. 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 Fill the earth. As we declare, this is the day. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. King of glory, fill the earth. A King of glory, fill the earth. King of glory, fill the earth as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made.
Amen. Isn't it amazing how fast life can change sometimes? I mean, and think about it. It was only eight weeks ago that we were all just kind of going about living life as normal, living life as we always had. It was, it was only eight weeks ago that the, the Dow Jones industrial average was at an all-time high. It was only eight weeks ago that our, our podcasts and news sources openly speculated about whether the unemployment rate could go any lower than the 3.5% that it was at. Eight weeks. Eight weeks ago, your, your favorite restaurant uh, would always be there. Eight weeks ago, you'd never have considered that your retirement might be lost or that your mortgage might not be payable. Eight weeks ago, your perfectly healthy mother or father or brother or sister or wife or husband or aunt or uncle or cousin or friend would seemingly always be there. Always. Everything that I just mentioned was, was a virtual certainty for you and for me until it wasn't. Isn't it amazing how fast life can change? You know, there are, there are very few times in our lives where we can truly say that, that life changed in an instant. Uh, September 11th, 2001, life changed in an instant. December 7th, 1941, a couple of years before I was born, life changed in an instant. Uh, if you're local, I, I suppose October 17th, 1989, life changed in an instant with a rumble. Well, you know, here in February, March, April, 2020, make no mistake, life has changed. And it, and it happened almost in an instant, didn't it? Eight weeks is all it took for us to go from where we were to, to where we are today. Eight weeks ago, it seemed that, that nobody was sick except for the, the normal stuff. And yet today, nearly a million Americans have this confirmed case of a virus. And likely it's, it's many more in reality, but, but nearly 50,000 of those confirmed cases have lost their lives. And these aren't just 50,000 people with, with terminal illnesses or 50,000 people with, with already weakened immune systems necessarily. No, in many cases, these are people who eight weeks ago were on cloud nine. These are people who, who eight weeks ago were, were scheduling summer vacations and looking forward to cruises and planning weddings and, and looking ahead to future babies and grandbabies. And the reality is that it's 50,000 people only as of today. I mean, the, the future is still yet to be determined. And so I want you to pause for just a moment and reflect on that staggering reality, not because I want you to to dwell in your fear, not because I want you to dwell in your anxiety, but because I want you to feel the weight of it for just a moment. Because that, that weight that you're feeling is going to help you this morning as we all enter into the story of God's people. You see, we're about to enter into a long journey together, a journey through some of the, the less visited, less well-known regions of the Bible. And, and it's a journey that isn't usually as, as obvious or, or as easy to relate to throughout the course of your life and mine. And yet, where we all sit today, it's, it's as relatable as it will probably ever be. If I sat back and I asked the average Christian or, or the average American Christian about the story of the Old Testament, like the vast majority of what I'd hear would come out of two books, Genesis and Exodus, right? Book one and book two of your Bibles. Because those are stories that we know. Those are stories that we're comfortable with. Those are stories we love to tell. We love talking about creation. We love talking about Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob and Joseph. We love the stories of Moses and the, and the great wonders that God did to free his people from Egyptian slavery. And out of these classic stories, emerge these, these rich images of, of large boats full of animals and, and burning bushes and parting seas and tablets of stone, like all these stories that you've seen in movies, all these stories that you were told in your Sunday school classes. And these are great stories. 
These are stories that I love to read. These are stories that I love to tell all the same. And yet as the Old Testament progresses, there's a new narrative that begins to emerge. It's a, it's a narrative where God's people no longer are being delivered from slavery, where God's people are no longer winning improbable battles, a story where, where God's people stop being, in a sense, God's people. And it's not by his choice. It's, it's by their own choice. And instead, God's people begin to, to live a new kind of reality, a reality where they put their faith in other kings and where they put their faith in other gods and where they put their faith in false idols. And I want to say this to you. like If we tried to measure the significance of a, of a particular story in the Bible based purely on how much was written about it, how much verbiage there is to explain, do you want to know the single most told story in the Old Testament? It's probably not about Adam or Noah or about Abraham or about Isaac or about Jacob or about Joseph or Moses or even King David. Now, I'd venture to say it's a story that we're about to begin to tell this morning. I'm calling this new series that we're, we're beginning today Captive. And it's a, it's a series designed to look at the intersection of, of faith and of life between God's people as they're, they're exiled, as they're removed from the promised land, and then they're held in captivity in the foreign nation of Babylon. And our story, as a people living in a different kind of exile, held in captivity in our own homes. And so we're going to be telling this story for the next four months as we look at the highs and the lows and everywhere in between of the story of God's people forcibly removed from a place of comfort and thrust immediately into a new normal. Like, what can we learn from their story? What does that pain feel like? What, what does exile feel like? What does return look like? And so those are important questions that all of us are facing right now. And those are questions that God's people encountered over several hundred years. This series is going to take us on a long journey, a journey through books like Second Chronicles and through Second Kings and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Haggai and Daniel and Lamentations, Ezra, Nehemiah. And I fully realize and expect that for some of you listening today, those are books you may have never read before. And that's okay. Like, you're not alone in that. Trust me, you're not alone in that. But this is a great time to encounter them. And so I hope you'll be blessed by this series as I am as excited to share it. And so I encourage you, buckle up. Stay with us. Keep showing up every week. And I believe God's Word is going to enrich your life with new stories that you may have never heard before. Or, if you have... Maybe you've struggled to really understand them in their, their proper context, in their proper biblical timeline. And so I, I want to invite you, wherever you are, to, to grab a Bible. Open up your favorite Bible app or your favorite phone or, or tablet or whatever, uh, and, and just find the book of Second Chronicles right now. Uh, if, if you're using a, a hard copy of your Bible, it's probably about a third of the way through your Bible. And so as you do that, I want to say this, you know, last week we had a guest speaker and we got a great message from my good friend, Fred Spain, who, who spoke about the disruption that Jesus brings into our lives with his resurrection from, from death to life. That, that disrupts us. It should disrupt us. And so as we kick off this new series, here's the thing I want you to be mindful of. Before we can ever talk about things like resurrection and salvation, those moments of ultimate orientation between us and God we first have to confront the reality of our disorientation or the reality that in and of ourselves, we are out of alignment with God in our lives. You know, two weeks ago for Easter, I, I walked each of us through the reality of, of Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden and how, how sin had introduced a new reality for humanity. That despite God's desire for togetherness and withness with people, His image bearers, Sin had resulted in an ultimate separation between God and between man. And man was, was removed from the garden. Man was kicked out of the garden. And there's a fancy word that we use to describe what that means or what that looks like. It's the word exile. Humanity was exiled from the presence of God. It's a word that describes being removed from your place of origin or removed from your home. And it's sort of the ultimate sign of dishonor. 
the ultimate sign of disrespect. Imagine that, being removed forcibly from your home. And so here in 2 Chronicles, exile is preparing to make its ugly return to the story of God's people. But you can't appreciate what they've lost until you appreciate what they had first. In fact, that's, that's why we're streaming here today in my living room. If, if you wondered why the, the sudden shift in location for our live stream this week, now you know. Like it's, it's a visual reminder of what it's like to, to be exiled, to be suddenly ripped from your home, from your place of comfort. And for, for many of us, the, the, the place of comfort or home when it comes to listening to a sermon or doing the church thing is in a church auditorium. That's where we've gone our entire lives. It's the place that provides us the most comfort when we're hearing about God. It's the place that's most familiar. And you know, for hundreds of years, Israel had become a sight to behold. It was a nation that was known for its wealth. It was a nation that was known for its unparalleled military power. Uh, in, in Numbers chapter 24, we get this prophecy before, the, before any of that happens. But it's a prophecy that's spoken over them by a man named Balaam, as a prophet of God. And he spoke about their kingdom being exalted. He said, he said that their, their strength was like that of a, of a wild ox. He spoke about their, their ability to devour hostile nations, to, to break their bones, to pierce them with arrows. And he said, he said, who dares to rouse them? Like he's talking about God's people here. Who dares to rouse them? Like they were to be feared. We think of King Solomon, the, the third king of Israel. He's the, he's the son of King David. And King Solomon was likely one of the richest men to have ever lived. Uh, one source I found this week gave his, his worth in modern currency as something like $2 trillion. I mean, think about that number. That's something that Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates can't even begin to fathom. $2 trillion? God's people, God's nation, they had everything they could possibly need. They had everything they could possibly want. They, they had money. They, they had power, they had influence, and, and most importantly, they had God's favor. They had God's protection. They, they had God's providence. And yet, in, in the wake of King Solomon, all of that would begin to unravel, little by, by little by little. First, the, the nation of Israel would, would divide into two separate kingdoms. Yet, Israel in the north, it would keep the name and then a southern kingdom that we, we later would come to, to call Judah in the south. Next, each kingdom would experience kind of a slow but steady degradation away from, from living according to God's ways and according to God's commands and wishes. And it would be present in both kingdoms, but more pronounced in the north first before eventually becoming true of the south as well. The, the northern kingdom of Israel would march out a series of 19 kings before they would fall to the Assyrians. And the Bible describes 18 of those kings as evil. The, the southern kingdom, Judah, marched out a series of 20 kings. And the Bible described 12 of those kings as evil. And so that's where we pick up today's text. And so I want you to turn to the very end of 2 Chronicles to, to chapter 36, verse 11. It, it's the account of the very last king of Judah. And this is what it says. It says, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God. And he did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke the word of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked and hardened his heart, and he would not turn to the Lord. He wouldn't turn to the God of Israel. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations, defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. You know, that, that was the world that, that Zedekiah lived in and fostered. It was, it was supposed to be God's chosen people, and yet the people became more and more unfaithful. 
And so I invite you to, to put yourself in God's shoes for just a moment. Like, what would you do if the people you'd done everything for, if the people that you'd loved, if the people that, that you'd supported, if the people that you'd protected began to turn their backs on you? Well, you'd probably do the same thing he did. It was time for God to act. And so we pick up the text again here in verse 15. It says, The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through, their, through his messengers again and again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers. They despised his words. They scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. He brought up against them the, the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with the, the sword in the sanctuary and did not spare young men or young women, the, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple. They, they broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They, they burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. And if that wasn't enough, look at what verse 20 says. Verse 20 says, he carried into exile to Babylon the remnant, those who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. And I want you just to stop and reflect for just a moment on what it would be like to be a resident of Judah or a resident in the holy city of Jerusalem here in 597 BC. Because for hundreds of years, you and the generations before you have had might. You've, you've had protection. You've had wealth. You've had everything that you thought you needed. And so you turn your back on God who made you who you were. Because you see, that's the thing about money and power and success is it often fools people into having a false sense of security, a certain air of invisibility about them. You know, it, it wasn't all that long ago that we all said goodbye to the, the public icon, Kobe Bryant, right? A, a man who was the very definition of success in this world, the very definition of charm or of wealth or of charisma or of likability. Like he had everything going for him. It seemed like nothing could touch him until it did. And I don't mean to imply that he carried himself that way at all. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that's why it hit us so hard. Because you could almost imagine it happening to anybody other than him. But just, just not him. He seemed different. He seemed invincible to some degree. Well, that story is the story of Jerusalem. That story is the story of Judah. That's, that's the story of King Zedekiah here. And, and yet, in a, in a near instant... The, the armies of Babylon surrounded their beloved city. They starved them. They, they breached their walls. And then they came in and they destroyed everything about them that gave them an identity. Like your, your beloved walls, breached. Your leaders, killed. Your temple, destroyed. Your treasures, stolen. Like everything, gone. Gone. Life can change in an instant. And it can leave you wondering, like, why? Like, why did God do all this? What, wasn't there some other way, like any other way? Like, what did this all accomplish? What, why would a good God inflict this kind of pain on his people? These people he said he loves so much, like, why would he do that? Well, guys, in, in the weeks to come, those are a lot of the questions that we're going to be exploring and we're going to be trying to answer. But we get a nice little clue from the prophet Ezekiel that I want to share with you today. Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 15. Why does God do this to Jerusalem? Like, why all this pain? He says in Ezekiel, so that hearts may melt. So that hearts may melt. If you read that in the NIV, it adds two words that really 
aren't there in the Hebrew. And I think takes away from Ezekiel's statement. The NIV adds with fear. No, that's not what the text says. The text says so that hearts may melt. Let me ask something. How do you deal with a hard heart? Well, you deal with it in kind of the same way you you deal with metal or cheese or ice cream or whatever. You melt it. You soften it. I can tell you firsthand as a dad that there have been times with each of my kids that their their stubbornness and arrogance and, and cluelessness about something vital, about something important, it just grew so large and so out of control that they became hard-hearted about what I had to say. And in those moments, the, the only way that I could parent them was, was to melt that hardness, that stubbornness within them, to soften them. And every single time, I guarantee that process was painful, but it was one that they needed to go through. And as a kid, I went through that, that, that journey, right? As kids, you all went through that journey. It's painful. And so the lives of those in Judah and Jerusalem changed dramatically. They, they change significantly. They change painfully. They, they change instantly when their walls fell. That false sense of, of superiority and security, man, it came crumbling down like a flash of lightning. And all of it was done so that hearts may melt. Friends, eight weeks ago, we had a lot of stuff in common with, with the Jerusalem of Zedekiah's day. We had one of the strongest economies we've ever had. We had one of the lowest unemployment rates we've ever had. Interest rates were low. Businesses were thriving. Like, yeah, we had our issues, sure, but on paper, man, our nation was strong. We had 800 more fighter jets than the next closest nation. We had nine more aircraft carriers than the next closest nation. We had 300 more nuclear warheads than the next closest nation. And we just started the Space Force. And all of this was to defend ourselves, to protect ourselves. And you know what it did? It made us feel safe. It made us feel strong. It made us feel protected. Like who can touch us? We're stronger than everyone. We have more than everyone. And, and all of that, all of everything we had, all it took was an invisible germ to bring us to our knees to bring the whole world to its knees. I've told you before, and I don't think it would be fair or appropriate for me to say that God is using this virus and this shelter in place to, to discipline us or to, to punish us or any of that. I'm, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not here to speak for God in the way that Ezekiel did. That's not my point. But here's what I will say. I'm not ruling it out. I'm not ruling it out. Like, what if all this pain, what if all this calamity that we're experiencing is here for a purpose? What if God is using it to get our attention? What if this virus is, is so that hearts may melt? Make no mistake, we, we may be stuck in our homes here, but, but this is no kind of normalcy. Like, we're in exile. We have been forced from the normal that we've come to know, and we are sojourners. We are wanderers, even in our own homes. Isn't it amazing how fast life can change? Like if there's one thing I hope we take away from this message this morning, it's this. When God applies heat, hard hearts become soft. When God applies heat, hard hearts become soft. The, the Babylon of our lives isn't an army of men right now. It's an army of, of microscopic germs, but the effect is all the same. Perhaps God is applying some heat. Perhaps he's tearing down our false senses of security and, and prosperity to soften and awaken our hearts for him. When God applies heat, hard hearts become soft. Church, friends, right now that the heat is on. The heat is on. How will you respond? That's the question we have to ask. How will I respond? Will I, will I shake my fists at the heavens in anger? Will I, will I blame and question God for, for using pain for His purposes? Or do I have a hard heart, a stubborn heart, a false sense 
uh, of my own security that needs to soften. And so where, where you are sitting today, I invite you, I invite you to search your heart this week. I invite you, I ask you, I encourage you to ask yourself the hard questions. You know, in Psalm 139, King David writes a song that, that ends with these two powerful verses, some of my very favorite in all the Psalms. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Friends, will you pray that prayer today? Will you invite God to search your heart? Even the darkest and deepest parts of your heart. Ask yourself whether you have humbled yourself before God or, or whether like King Zedekiah, you allowed yourself to become stiff-necked and hard-hearted toward the God who loves you. Friends, God bless you. Have a great week. I invite you to consider what God may be doing in this season in your life. Ask yourself the hard questions. Ask God to search you. He may be trying to melt something within you. Have a great week. to come inside and gently break my heart. My heart is hard, my soul so weak, the ways of evil cut so deep. I need you, Lord, to come inside. As I was listening to Josh's lesson this morning, I was thinking about how often it is in our lives that we have to be confronted, whether it's by circumstances or by the people in our lives, to really sometimes see ourselves the way that God would have us to see ourselves, to strip away the ego and the pretension and the self-importance, to really look at ourselves in a spiritual mirror and see ourselves with clarity. And I think about the circumstance that we read about in 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, where David, the king of Israel, is confronted by Nathan the prophet when David had committed the sins of murder and adultery. And that confrontation really forced David to look at himself in Nathan's words to see that he was the man who had done these terrible things. And David took that so greatly to heart that he would go and sit down and write the heartrending words of the 51st Psalm. Just listen to what he says beginning in verse 10. David writes, Create in me a pure heart, O God, 
and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David was heartbroken because he realized by nature of Nathan's confrontation who he really was and what he had really done. And as Josh suggests in his message today, all of us need to take the circumstances that we find ourselves in and use it as an opportunity to look at ourselves maybe more clearly than we ever had and see ourselves with some rather serious clarity as we consider who we really are and what our relationship really is and should be to our God. Let's pray. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for your infinite blessings in a time when, Father, it is sometimes easy for us to forget how truly blessed that we are. But Father, we pray that through the study of your word this morning and through our worship together, that you will help us to really look at ourselves and see ourselves inwardly with the depth that you see us as you look at us and to ask ourselves a question of whether we are indeed stiff-necked and hard-hearted in ways that perhaps we don't see when we look at ourselves and to help us to have softer hearts to help us to use the difficulty of the times that we live in to realize how great our need is for you and how desperately we should want relationship with you. Help us to be humbled, Father, because we are not everything that we think we are. But when we see ourselves through your eyes, as we reflect our character through your word, we realize how far we have to go in measuring ourselves against the perfect standard of your son, Jesus. Not that we ever reach that standard, Father, but that with every day and with every step that we take, we strive to become better and better in following in his footsteps. Father, we just thank you so much for the time that we've had to worship together today, for the message that Josh has brought us. And we just pray that as we go through this week in, in these challenging times, that each of us will have our eyes open to our true selves and that we will find it within us to have softer hearts and, and necks that do not stiffen themselves against you, but that turn more readily to the, the needs of those around us and looking for ways that we can help and that we can influence others with the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, it, it's such a blessing to have you here with us with Lake Merced Church of Christ. Obviously, we're, we're not meeting in our usual location. It's been great to have you in my home down here in Pacifica. Uh, but I, I just want to thank you for spending this time with us. I want to ask you a couple of favors. Number one, if you heard the message today, and there was something about that that made you say, like, I, I, I need Jesus in my life right now. Like, I recognize that, that there's some urgency in, in my relationship with God. I, I want to invite you to that. If, if you would email us at questions at lakemercedchurch.com or drop a comment in the comment section, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, uh, we would love to know what's on your heart right now. And secondarily, if you would, I'm going to ask you one more time, please, if you would share this video. On, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, wherever you might be, uh, let those in your network of friends know something more about Jesus, that there's, there's hope found in him. And that when God acts in these moments, he's not doing it to hurt us, he's doing it to melt us, he's doing it to soften us. And I, I hope that that blesses you, I hope that that encourages you. We got, we got a big journey ahead of us in this series. I hope you'll come back next week for us as we do part two of our captive series. Thank you for joining us at the Lake Merced Church of Christ. It's been great to have you. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.